international copyright law and may not be broadcast or duplicated in any form without the express written consent of Crossroads Video Services. Intended for home use only, Crossroads Video Services is a division of Main Roads Productions Incorporated, 310 Judson Street, Unit 14, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M8Z1V3. Did you know that Louis Pasteur was famous for something other than pasteurizing milk? Do you think that life could have developed on Earth by chance? Where did the first cell come from? Join us for the next 30 minutes as we look at these and other questions. I'm your host, David Maines, and this is Crossroads. How did life begin on planet Earth? Many people believe this age-old question has been conclusively settled. But let's look at the nature of life itself. Every living thing that we see is made up of cells. Just as life itself is diverse, so are the cells that constitute life. As a matter of fact, the cell is the smallest particle of life that can function as an independent unit. Yet there's a difference between a cell that is living and a cell that is dead. How do you define the life that's gone? Although we have an imperfect understanding of what life is, we can say that to have life, a living organism, such as the single-celled microscopic life form that you see here, we must have the following four characteristics. One. It must be similar to others of its kind, but not an exact duplicate. Two, it must be able to repair and duplicate itself. Three, it must be able to adjust to changing environmental conditions. And four, it must have an urge or drive towards self-fulfillment. The amoeba beautifully demonstrates that vaguely definable urge. If you remove that urge, all that remains is a piece of dead material. Now, what about our original question? How did life begin? Until just over a century ago, two answers had been offered. The first was based upon the Bible account given in the book of Genesis. This account, summarized in the 16th century woodcuts, said that life was created supernaturally by the hand of God in six days. The second explanation was that life arose continuously from non-life. This was based upon such everyday observations as maggots, which were seen to crawl from rotten meat. This was known as spontaneous generation. In the mid-1860s in France, uh, Louis Pasteur, a brilliant scientist, proved beyond doubt that there was no such thing as spontaneous generation. This left those who did not wish to accept the supernatural explanation in the uncomfortable position of having no position, no answer at all. For more than half a century, they stopped asking the question. Then, in 1936, the Russian biochemist A.I. Oparin proposed that life began in some primordial sea. O'Paran's theory has provided the foundation upon which others have since built their life's work. Our Crossroads guest today is Dr. Duane Gish. Dr. Gish received his doctorate in biochemistry from the University of California at Berkeley and did postdoctoral work at Cornell Medical College. We asked Dr. Gish to explain to us the current evolutionary views of the beginning of life. The evolutionary continuum, as we might uh, uh, mention, might call it, uh, would uh, postulate that life evolved. They, of course, they postulate the universe evolved, stars evolved, our planetary system, solar system evolved, and life evolved. And so they must somehow try to explain how that first cell came into being from some dead, inanimate world. So they postulate that uh, in the early stages of the Earth, uh, there were very simple chemicals present. 
gases, methane, ammonia, hydrogen, of course water vapor, nitrogen, and some other simple gases. And then they postulate that by some interaction of these gases with electrical discharges, this is lightning or the ultraviolet light from the sun, somehow, first of all, these relatively simple chemicals accumulated, mm -hmm. amino acids, sugars, and things like that, the building blocks of proteins and DNA and RNA, and then later on, proteins and DNA and RNA molecules accumulated, large and very complex molecules, and finally, spontaneously, all by themselves, they got organized into systems, which eventually became a living cell. Now, that's the theory. However, I find this theory to be contradicted by the laws of chemical thermodynamics and kinetics, by the laws of probability, and by every application of real science that we can apply, I find this to be an untenable theory. Uh, for example, the idea that even simple chemicals could have accumulated in significant quantities is simply is not in accord with the best facts of science. Mm -hmm. Now here's the problem. They say that ultraviolet light or these electrical discharges acting on these gases uh, created enormous quantities of amino acids mm -hmm. and things like that. Now you understand you have to have enormous quantities. Our ocean contains 355 million cubic miles of water. And if you're going to have anything of any significance in that much water, you've got to have billions and billions and billions of tons of each one of these particular chemicals. So you have to have a, a very efficient method to synthesize or to form these chemicals. However, if you have something like ultraviolet light or electrical discharges acting on these simple gases, you will produce a few molecules of these more complex things like amino acids and things like that. However, that very same energy, either the electrical discharge or the ultraviolet light, is so much, much, much more efficient in destroying those same products that the, when you compare the rate of synthesis, the rate mm -hmm. of formation of these simple compounds to their rate of destruction, by the same energy source, you find that the rates of destruction exceed the rates of formation by anywhere from 10,000 to 100,000 times. Notice how the original atmosphere of the Earth, before life began, is assumed to consist of a mixture of methane, hydrogen gases, and ammonia. Now, ammonia is the essential ingredient of amino acids, yet no one seems to have questioned how this is supposed to have originated. Dr. Gish continues. For example, in the uh, apparatus used by Stanley Miller in his famous experiment where he's generated amino acids and so forth, he had this apparatus with the gases circulating through the apparatus and being sparked by an electrical discharge. And he had a trap in the bottom of the apparatus where the products accumulated. And after a couple of weeks, he had a detectable quantity of product which he was able to uh, analyze and determined there were a few amino acids there. So everybody said, well, he's demonstrated that life could have arisen spontaneously. The famous and oft-quoted Miller experiment. Here is the Miller apparatus, and here is the trap spoken of by Dr. Gish. The late Dr. Bronowski, who was one of the leaders in the modern movement of scientific humanism, describes the crucial Miller experiment in his book, The Ascent of Man. This book was written as a result of the well-known BBC television series. In the chapter in which Dr. Bonowski asks how life began, he says, and I quote, that question was answered in a beautiful experiment by Stanley Miller in America around about 1950. He put the atmosphere in a flask, the methane, the ammonia, the water, and so on, and went on for day after day, and boiled and bubbled them up, put an electric charge through them to simulate lightning and other violent forces, and visibly the mixture darkened. Why? Because on testing it, it was found that amino acids had been formed. That is a crucial step forward since amino acids are the building blocks of life. From them, the proteins are made, 
and proteins are the constituents of all living things. Notice how the trap, so vital to the experiment, was never even mentioned. Yet in this popular television series, and uh, a book written by a man of acknowledged intellectual standing, the reader is led to believe that the question has been answered to perfect satisfaction. Let us hear now what Dr. Gish, a man well qualified in biochemical research, has to say about the Miller experiment. The only thing that he produced were a few amino acids, and that's infinitely room, removed from a living cell, very, very far from a cell, with all of its complex chemicals and structures. Furthermore, the only reason he even got a detectable quantity of amino acids is because he had that trap. But you see, on the scenario for the origin of life, of course, doesn't include organic chemists with their traps. You have the hypothetical primordial earth with its atmosphere and its ocean. Now, once those chemicals are formed in the atmosphere, it takes years, literally, uh, for them to filter down into the ocean. And during that time, they're getting destroyed by the electrical discharges in the ultraviolet light. And even after they found their way into the ocean, mm -hmm. the forces of destruction are so great there uh, that you have end up with no detectable quantity mm -hmm. of product. The forces destroying them exceeds the forces forming them by enormous rate. Now, here's another interesting aspect. Dr. Miller placed a trap in his apparatus. That saved his product so that he got a detectable quantity of product. Now, even if one could imagine there were a trap of that kind, and there's really no trap on the primitive earth, but the trap itself is fatal to origin of life theories. Now, Dr. Miller, indeed, he trapped out his product, his amino acids. He had them isolated in this trap, protected from the electrical discharges or the ultraviolet light. He preserved that product. He saved his product. But now you see, since he has no energy, since he has removed that product from the energy, he has no way to get to the next step. Because if you have amino acids, and you're gonna make proteins from amino acids, you have to join those amino acids together. You have to link them together chemically. And that requires energy. But he has no energy. He's isolated the material, put it in a trap. Mm -hmm. You see, he's reached a dead end. We mentioned earlier the medieval notion of spontaneous generation. This view was based upon mistaken observation. It said, for example, that mice were generated spontaneously from bundles of filthy rags. In other words, life arose from non-life. These ideas, which seem ludicrous to us now, were finally put to rest in 1862 by the classic work of Louis Pasteur. Yet from Stanley Miller's graduate work in 1952, men once again eagerly embraced the notion of spontaneous generation. Of course, in its 20th century version, it's couched in more acceptable surroundings, laboratory glassware instead of bundles of filthy rags. But the principle is still the same, life arising spontaneously from non-life. Returning to Dr. Gish, we posed him this question. Just suppose that this assumed primordial sea had some atoms of the right kind which had been brought together without a chemist or a trap to form amino acids. Then further, suppose that there are a sufficient number and diversity of those amino acid molecules to meet each other. Is there any way of calculating what the probability would be of those amino acids coming together to form the first protein molecule. The probability that even one single protein yeah. molecule, even one single molecule of a protein with the amino acids ranged in the precise order required for the mm -hmm. biological activity, such as an enzyme or a hormone, the probability that those amino acids would come together in that order is abs would tell us it would never happen, not in three billion years, would you ever even get one single molecule. You see, in a pro let's, let's assume this protein has 100 amino acids. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not a very large protein. Most have 300, 400, 500 amino acids arranged in precise order. But let's assume it's only 100. 
Now, right now in proteins, you have 20 different kinds of amino acids. Mm -hmm. Of course, on this hypothetical primordial earth, you'd have many more than just 20. You'd have several hundred. But we're going to make it easier for the evolutionists. Let's assume we only had the 20. Now, you've got these 20 amino acids in this ocean, mm -hmm. right? Now you've got to form this protein by chance. Just as if I had a box back here with amino acids in them. And I, now I have to form this one molecule. I, have to, I need a certain amino acid mm -hmm. to be number one. Maybe it's phenylalanine. So I reach back here in this box without looking, mm -hmm. and I pluck out amino acid. Well, it's not phenylalanine. It's something else. So I throw it away, and I try again. Now, since there are 20 different kinds, I have one chance out of 20 of getting the first amino acid right. Well, finally, I, I do. That's not bad, one chance out of 20. But now I've only got one. Now I need to get the second one in the right order. Not just any old amino acid, but there's a certain amino acid that must be number two. So I reach back in here, blindly, as chance would do, and I pull out another amino acid. I have only one chance out of 20 of getting that right. Well, I have one chance out of 20 of getting the first one right, one chance out of 20 of getting the second right. That's one over 20 times one over 20. I have only ch one chance out of 400 of getting two in the right order. But now remember, I have to do this 100 times. And 100 times successively, I must have the right amino acid. What's the probability, if you had to choose from 20, to get to make the right choice 100 times successively? Well, it's 20 to the 100th power, or mathematically, that's equal to 10 raised to the 130th power. 10 multiplied times itself 130 times. Now, that's the probability of getting one single protein molecule of 100 amino acids. Now, that number is so enormously large, the probability really is nil. To give us some idea of the scale of events involved in this imagined evolution of the first living cell, we'll suppose that each atom in the cell is represented by the thickness of a piece of typing paper. The number of atoms required to form a typical amino acid would be represented by a pile of papers less than a quarter of an inch high. The 400 or so amino acids in one protein molecule would be represented by a pile of papers about 10 inches high. While to form the first living cell, although microscopic in size, would require thousands of specifically arranged protein molecules and would bring our pile of paper well beyond the height of Toronto's CN Tower, the tallest freestanding structure in the world. So we can see how remote the chance is of forming one protein molecule from the amino acids. We then ask Dr. Gish to pursue the impossible and tell us what's required to form a living cell from protein molecules. Even as, if this should happen by some miracle, of course you get one molecule and it's going to fall apart naturally in the next few seconds anyhow. But to have a living cell, the most primitive living cell that we could conceive of as biochemists, what do we need what would we imagine? We'd need to have a simple, very simple living cell. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly it would include several hundred protein molecules. It would include at least several mm -hmm. hundred DNA molecules and RNA molecules, which are very, very large and complex, even more complex than a protein molecule. You'd need all of many other complex molecules. Now, that means we'd probably have to have maybe 1,500, 2,000, 3,000 different kinds of protein, RNA, and DNA molecules. But that still would not suffice for a living cell. You must have the membrane. You've got to hold that together. Membranes are very complex structures. You've got to have some energy factory of some kind. Most cells have mitochondria, which are very complex structures. Microsomes, where the proteins are synthesized, the Golgi bodies, and everything else certainly got to have all that genetic material there, then all of that has to be put together in just one particular way. Using accepted scientific methods of mathematical proof, Dr. Gish has shown us how impossible it is that the right combination of atoms would come together to form the first living cell. But this is only the beginning. Evolutionist theory now has to account for the great diversity of living things. We ask Dr. Gish to give us their explanation. We start with this little single cell. Now, according to the theory of evolution, that is the theory that is accepted by almost all evolutionists, this little cell, as it began to reproduce itself, it would make mistakes from time to time. We call them mutations. 
it just in reproducing itself it might make a typographical error so to speak mm -hmm. it repro reproduces its genes and it really cells do this with incredible fidelity it's, it's amazing how a cell can reproduce itself uh, trillions of times and never make a mistake but sometimes they do it puts in the wrong unit in a gene now a gene is made up of thousands of units it may put in just one wrong unit out of these thousands but the results can be disastrous. Experiments uh, done over almost half a century uh, and involving uh, hundreds of generations of fruit flies have always produced deformed flies, a result of harmful mutations. The theory of evolution proposes that once in a while a good mutation can occur, and therefore the next generation could be improved. This improvement would be passed on to future generations, and with further good mutations, a new species will evolve. Now, what conclusions can we draw from our search? First, it's impossible to expect amino acids to form protein molecules by random meeting. Secondly, it is impossible for protein molecules to form a living cell by chance happening. Further, it is impossible for these cells to diversify into all living things by chance mutations. In the face of all the statistics showing the impossibility of such complexity happening by chance, no matter how many billions of years are allotted, the faithful believers in the theory that life evolved still concede that it has happened by spontaneous generation. The only alternative explanation for life on Earth is special creation, a supernatural act of God. The incredibly complex design of the living cell makes the most complicated machine man has devised look like child's play. Yet it all takes place in such small dimensions, detailed fitting of a molecule to molecule. Such design surely speaks of a designer. But returning to our original question, what is life? Uh, even if man could, by some miracle of technology, make a cell, could he infuse that cell with life? Simpler yet, could man begin with a cell that had recently died and infuse it with life? There is more to a cell or a human being than the mechanistic evolutionary theses would suggest. When we acknowledge that God is the designer and creator of each living thing, we also find that it is God who imparts to each cell life, that spirit or that urge to fulfill. The living cell, then, is the meeting point of two realms, the physical and the spirit. The physical realm is familiar and it can be measured, but the spirit realm is something of another dimension and totally inaccessible to man's scientific inquiry. Psalm 104, verse 30, tells us that in all living things, it's God who sends forth his spirit and creates them. We're also reminded in uh, Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 7, that at the appointed time of death, the spirit shall return to God who gave it. God is sovereignly in charge of the life of every living thing. And in some way, which is really beyond our understanding, he is that life. For it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, he is before all things, and by him all things hold together. If you cross a horse and a donkey, you get a mule. Have you ever wondered why mules cannot reproduce? If you had all time at your disposal, do you think you could ever turn a frog into a prince, or a fish into a philosopher, or even a molecule into a man? 
I invite you to examine with me for the next 30 minutes some of the most accepted and yet questionable ideas concerning the origin of species. I'm your host, David Maines, and this is Crossroads. Have you ever stopped to consider the great variety there is in the human race? We come in a multitude of shapes, sizes, and colors, each uniquely different. There is perhaps even a greater variety in the animal and plant kingdom. For example, one only has to think of all the different types of dogs seen in a dog show from the little Chihuahua to the great big St. Bernard and every shape and size in between all belong to the same species we call dog. They are known as a species because they're all potentially capable of interbreeding. For instance, dogs do not interbreed with cats, so therefore cats are a separate species. In some very rare instances, two similar species, such as a horse and a donkey, can interbreed, but their offspring, the mule, is always sterile. So this cannot be the beginning of a new species. Animal breeders recognize the wide variation there can be in a species and patiently select and breed to produce certain desired characteristics. But the offspring are always of the same species. Following his five-year voyage, Charles Darwin was very impressed by the great variety in every form of life. Darwin was also familiar with animal and plant breeding techniques, and it occurred to him that if man could artificially select certain animals for breeding and produce desired characteristics, then perhaps nature had been working in a similar way, but over an infinitely longer period of time. Darwin called this natural selection, and he suggested that this came about during the struggle for survival, where within each niche of the environment, only those best fitted would tend to survive. By extending this observation further, Darwin theorized that it was this process of natural selection that when continued over millions of years was responsible for all life forms seen on Earth today. He said it all began with very simple cells which in time became fish. Certain of these fish crawled out onto dry land to become reptiles, some of which became birds and others eventually evolved into apes and finally man. This picture is familiar to most of us and is known as the theory of evolution. But did the fish really grow legs and become a reptile? Did the frog really become a prince? When Darwin published his theory in 1859, there were a few who had rejected the supernatural account of man's beginnings and therefore they eagerly adopted the new theory rather than have no other explanation to offer. One such man was Thomas Henry Huxley. Although he could not accept that natural selection would change one species into another, say, fish into a reptile, he was the most vigorous champion of Darwin's theory. Indeed, we may never have even heard of Darwin today had it not been for Huxley. Today, we're going to look at the question of the origin of species. We want to begin by asking Dr. Gary Parker, to tell us what Darwin meant by natural selection. Dr. Parker did his doctoral work in biology and geology and is the author of five textbooks and is currently research associate at the Institute for Creation Research. Darwin used the example of the pigeon. The common wild rock pigeon that you see around statues and barns and so on can be bred to make uh, pigeons with fancy fan tails or uh, with a big neck pouch, you know, and things like this. Uh, but all of these can be bred right back to the wild rock pigeon. That variation is built right into them. Uh, the most famous example Darwin used for uh, the concept of natural selection were the Galapagos finches. These birds that inhabit the islands off the west coast of South America sometimes called Darwin's finches. 
And so Darwin noted that uh, among these finches, there were some with small beaks that would be able to move around and catch insects, some with large beaks for crushing seeds and so on. He observed the ones with the little beaks were found on the islands where insects were the most abundant food source. And the ones with the big beaks were seeds were the most abundant food source. He said, as I was sailing around South America on the famous ship, the Beagle, he observed a variety of finches on the mainland. And let's assume that during some kind of storm, a vegetation matter so washed out with some of these birds, and then they populated those islands that had the right kind of food source for them. And so really, that was the problem. In spite of the fact his book was called Origin of Species, the one thing he never talked about was the origin of species. He was always talking about the second half of his book title, the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. And so that's what we see. If you have a variety of finches, you can explain how and where they survive, but not how they originated. It seems that there's evidence that Darwin was correct about natural selection. The example that's used over and over again are the dark and light phases of a moth that lives in the forest around London, England. And sure enough, back in the mid-1800s, uh, the camouflaged form was the light form that hid on the uh, lichen-encrusted bark of the trees. But as the pollution killed off the lichen, it was the dark form that was more camouflaged. So more of them survived to lay eggs for the next generation, and so the population shifted to the dark form. As I used to tell my classes when I was an evolutionist, that's proof positive. Evolution going on today, I would say. We asked Dr. Parker if this was really proof. Is that really proof of evolution? Nowadays, I'd look at it quite differently. No, it isn't. It isn't really proof of evolution at all. There's a huge difference between a change from a moth to a moth. <laughs> Both kinds of moth exist right from the beginning, and they stay the same species of moth at the end. What real evolution is, is change from molecules to men. That's not my title. That's the title of a high school biology textbook. Or as another evolutionist said it, the change from fish to philosopher. There's a big difference between moth to moth <laughs> and molecules to men. And so that's the difference between natural selection, which is really a limited idea about variation within kind, and evolution, which is the idea of variation from one kind to another. What Dr. Parker has told us is that there is indeed the possibility of a wide variation within each species, and that even over a few decades, the overall characteristics of any species can change. But there is no evidence that one species can become another. The finches on the Galapagos Islands and the moths in England are the living examples of natural selection from the variety that is possible within each species. But remember, the finches are still finches. They haven't changed into warblers or woodpeckers. And the moths are still moths. The theory of evolution says that given a long enough time, the finches will become a separate species, a distinctly different kind of creature. High school biology textbooks contain what are known as phylogenetic charts, such as this one that we have right here, which purport to show how one species has changed into another. Is there any factual basis for these charts? We went to the School of Anatomy at the University of Waterloo and posed this question to Dr. Don Ranney, who has qualifications in both anthropology and medicine and is a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons. Biology books such as this one often contain a number of phylogenetic charts. These are sort of family trees which attempt to show the relationship between uh, different animals, as in this case. Now it's quite all right to group animals together according to common characteristics, to classify them as species and families and so on, but then to put them down on a page and say that they are therefore related by being derived from a common ancestor is not really scientific because in many cases uh, they don't even suggest who the ancestor is. So we see that the phylogenetic chart or family tree has no basis in fact. Professor Rani has pointed out that although it may be convenient to group creatures together according to some common characteristics, there is no justification for drawing lines between them to indicate a relationship 
or common ancestry. We have seen in previous programs in this series that if species had evolved one from another, then a great many transitional or intermediate forms should be found in the fossil record. In fact, in over 100 years of searching, only one fossil of this type has ever been found. And even that has been a source of controversy since its discovery in 1862. Archaeopteryx is claimed to be the missing link. From reptile to bird, and it's usually found quoted in textbooks as proof that species evolved one from another. Is Archaeopteryx truly the classic example of the missing link? We want to return now to Dr. Parker, who at one time taught evolution as a fact, and he used the example of Archaeopteryx, the alleged link between reptile and bird, as proof that one species could actually evolve into another. Uh, the specimen is quite interesting. Uh, it has feathers and it has beak. And so you look at the specimen as it's printed on the limestone, the Solenhofen limestone in Germany, say, well, it's a bird. But as you look more closely at the skeleton, you find that it has a long bony tail, which birds don't have, unfused backbones, which is more like a reptile, little claws on the wings and teeth in the beak. <laughs> All of a sudden, it does look like an in-between form. But on second glance, <laughs> maybe not so much after all. There are several living birds. Uh, the most familiar is the ostrich that have claws on the wings. No living birds have teeth, but some fossil birds have teeth, so that's not so crucial. Some reptiles have teeth and some don't. Then if you really ask the question, does Archaeopteryx, this reptile bird, show how scales evolved into feathers? Not at all. The first time we find feathers as fossils, we find completely developed feathers, Ostrom says with barbs and barbules, of several different kinds, of primary flight feathers and this, that, and the other. In fact, in the literature recently, there been a number of articles suggesting that Archaeopteryx was probably a strong flyer. It has the asymmetric wing that we find, or vein through the feather that we find only in strong flyers. And so many evolutionists are now regarding Archaeopteryx as the first bird. There's no indication of where the wings came from a running leg. The first time we find wings in the fossil record, we find completely developed wings. For the time being, the last uh, piece in this puzzle was put into place by Jensen out in Utah. He discovered bones of just regular birds in the same system as Archaeopteryx. So Archaeopteryx can't be the ancestor of birds since birds were already there. In spite of the fact that school textbooks say more and more missing links have been found, the truth is that Archaeopteryx is the only example ever given. At one time, the evolution of the horse was held as classic proof of the theory, but this is now largely discredited, even though displays of horse skeletons may still be found in our museums. We hope to bring you the facts regarding the horse skeletons in a future program. But now, we want to turn your attention to another topic. The Encyclopedia Britannica is held by many to be the epitome of trustworthiness and the ultimate compendium of all knowledge. This is a volume from the 15th edition published in 1974. Under the heading of Biogenetic Law, we find this description. The Biogenetic Law, also known as the Recapitulation Theory and postulated by Ernst Haeckel in 1866, states that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that is, the development of the animal embryo and young traces the evolutionary development of the species. Uh, quoting again from this same edition, we find this. Thus, the presence of gill clefts in the mammalian embryo can be understood as a remnant of a common ancestor. In layman's language, this means that during the development of the embryo or fetus in the womb of every mammal, including man, there has been at one stage gill slits, as in fish. This is implied as proof of evolution. We invite you to look up biogenetic law or recapitulation theory in any encyclopedia or textbook. Some of the older editions will even add that the human embryo recapitulates the frog stage with a three-chamber heart and the primate stage with a tail. 
But what are the facts? We asked Professor Ranney to explain. Here is a biology book called Biological Science by William Keaton. This is a 1972 uh, second edition of this work and it is used in a number of universities where uh, in courses where general biology is taught. He refers to this work of Haeckel and shows the very same picture of embryos that was produced in the 19th century where we see similarities and you can easily see differences too in the development of the various embryos uh, fish, salamander, turtles, chick, rabbit, and man. It has often been stated that the human embryo has gill slits. Now it's true that certain parts of the neck and face develop from structures known as branchial arches. And these have a resemblance in the embryo to the structures which in the fish develop into gills. But the human embryo never develops true gills. It does not have all the other things that are necessary to function as gills. And uh, in any case, uh, the gills are for breathing in the water. And the, the uh, human embryo gets all its oxygen requirements uh, from its mother's circulation. There's, there's really no connection at all. It's just another example of how the same structures can be used to form different things in different species if the plan for that development is different. In this text, Medical Embryology by Jan Langman, and the statement in fact is made, and I quote, the pharyngeal arches and clefts are frequently referred to as branchial arches and branchial clefts in analogy with the lower vertebrates. Since the human embryo never has gills, called branchia, the term pharyngeal arches and clefts has been adopted for this book. Now here is a modern writer merely affirming from embryological studies that there is really no essential similarity between the human embryo and the fish embryo. Now, if we wanted to use that, uh, that argument that is used by those who believe in evolution, though, we would run into some difficulties. Because if we look further at the human, we see that uh, both his hands and his feet have webs before they become separated. Now, does that mean that we are related to ducks? We then asked Professor Rani if it was true that the heart of the human embryo develops sequentially, indicating that we recapitulate the heart of the fish, the frog, and the reptile before becoming human. The theory of evolution teaches that in our development, uh, we go through stages which recapitulate the development of the uh, of uh, mankind uh, through uh, fish forms, uh, uh, reptile-like um, ancestors, and so on. And so one of the key points is that the, in the embryological development, there's first of all a one stage, a one, or rather a one chamber heart, then a two chamber heart, a three chamber heart, and a four chamber heart. And if you look in the embryology books, that's exactly the way it's described. However, I came across this just the other day. Uh, this is a book by um, Ari, Developmental Anatomy, a highly respected textbook in embryology, in which he cuts right down to the truth. He says the development of the heart includes eight different stages, and although most of these processes go on simultaneously, it is more convenient to describe them separately. You might find it interesting to know something of the historical background of these ideas. Earlier in the program, we mentioned that Ernst Haeckel had originated the theory of recapitulation or biogenetic law, as it came to be called. Professor Haeckel worked in Germany at Jena University and was a keen supporter of Darwin's theory of evolution. In 1866, he published this series of drawings of animal and human embryos, the pig, the cow, the rabbit, and the human being, as proof of the theory. Three years later, in 1869, it was discovered that Haeckel had fraudulently misrepresented the facts to fit the theory, and he was, in fact, censured by the university court. Those working in the field of embryology today know that there is no truth 
to the biogenetic law, and some even know that it was based on Heckel's fraud exposed in 1869. Yet the textbooks and even the Encyclopedia Britannica still report it as a fact. The fact that it takes time to update texts can hardly be used as an excuse, since it is now over 100 years since the fraud was exposed. Finally in our program today, we want to bring before you one more item that we find in the textbooks as proof of this biogenetic law and evolution. Let me quote from this college textbook on the subject of vestigial organs. The fused vertebrae, which makes up the base of the human spine, are interpreted as the vestigial remnants of the tail possessed by our ancestors. Once again, we ask Professor Rani to comment. At the very end, there is a little thing which looks very much like a tail. This is called the coccyx. Now, the coccyx is at the lower end of the vertebral column and as you can see from this view it projects inward and helps support the floor of the pelvis. Now we can do without that it can be surgically removed but when it is surgically removed the fibrous tissue around the vertebra serve as a mooring point in place of the vertebra themselves for all these muscles and other tissues in here which support the internal organs when we are in the erect position. We have brought before you today just a glimpse of what is being offered in our schools and universities as proof that one species has evolved into another. Perhaps in a future program in this series, we can present the facts regarding genetic mutation, which is the current theory to explain how, in the course of hundreds of generations, the molecule became man. However, for the time being, we leave it to you to decide for yourself if there is sufficient evidence to show that the different species originated by evolution. If you do not find these evolutionary proofs convincing, then the only alternative explanation is the supernatural creation of individual life forms. And of course, it was this very explanation that Darwin and his followers rejected over a century ago. May we suggest that the Bible, after all, gives a far more adequate explanation for the origin of species than Darwin or his successors have ever done. The Bible tells us that after God created the animals, each creature brought forth and began to multiply after his kind. Further details of this program series can be found in the book In the Minds of Men, Darwin and the New World Order by Ian Taylor. Tracing the rise of humanism from the time of the Greeks to its present workings in governments today, this 500-page hardcover edition contains full documentation, illustrated with over 180 engravings and photographs. To order, please send in check or money order 2895 to Main Roads Productions, 100 Huntley Street, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y2L1. Each year, thousands of tourists take their holiday trip to the state of Arizona. There they see one of the most spectacular works of nature, the Grand Canyon. For the geologist, the Grand Canyon is said to be an open textbook. But do we know what caused the canyon? Has its complete story ever been told? For the next 30 minutes, come with us to the canyon. I'm your host, David Maines, and this is Crossroads.
The search for new sources of oil is very much in the news today, and it's of concern to each of us. Most people are probably aware that an essential part of the search for oil consists of drilling a hole deep into the Earth's surface. For every successful drilling that produces oil, literally hundreds of holes are drilled at great expense that never produce any oil. Now, how do geologists know when to continue drilling or when to discontinue? These important decisions are made by inspecting a core of rock which is removed from the drill hole and looking not for traces of oil, but for certain fossil remains which indicate the presence of oil. These remains are commonly found thousands of feet beneath the Earth's surface. Today we're going to look at how the fossils and the rocks are related. However, of even greater importance than rocks, fossils, or oil is the relationship between the story found in the rocks and our philosophy and lifestyle today. We begin our story in Edinburgh, Scotland, in the 1700s, with a many talented man, James Hutton. Hutton was a physician, a gentleman farmer, owner of a chemical factory, and a jurist. Like other literate men of his time, he'd been brought up with a knowledge of the Bible. Looking back from where we stand today, it's important to realize that in Hutton's time, and throughout the next century, men accepted the Bible account of creation. They believed that the earth and all living things were created supernaturally in six literal days. They believed in a worldwide catastrophe, a flood, and that all this happened only a few thousand years ago. In fact, the Bibles printed during the 1800s had dates appended to each event, beginning with the creation of the world in 4004 BC. In his study of rock formations, particularly this extinct volcano just outside Edinburgh, Hutton concluded that the truth about the Earth's history was not to be found in the Bible, but in the rocks themselves. He said that rather than attributing the signs of catastrophe we see in nature to the flood of Noah, they could more rationally be explained in terms of the forces we see acting in nature today. Hutton's assumption that the present is the key to the past required millions of years, however, rather than the few thousand required by the orthodox biblical account. Another well-educated and financially independent Scotsman, born the year that Hutton died, took Hutton's proposal a step further. On the basis of his own extensive studies of rock formations in England and Europe, Charles Lyell published his monumental work, Principles of Geology, in 1830. He was only 33. Lyell re-emphasized Hutton's claim that the evidence of catastrophe in the past is really the result of very slow changes which have taken place over millions of years. The idea of gradual change, uniformitarianism, as it came to be called, eventually eclipsed the biblical idea of a worldwide catastrophe. Lyell had observed that rocks formed in layers, each layer being distinguished by a different texture or color. Some of these rock layers had evidently been hot and pliable at one time, but most consisted of compacted sediment, the mud, which collects at the bottom of freshwater lakes or saltwater seas. The presence of those sedimentary rocks, which are found throughout the world, indicates that the area had once been covered by a deep body of water. Naturally, those rock layers, which had formed first, were the most ancient and would be found at the bottom those layers most recently deposited would be found at the top. Before continuing further with the story of Charles Lyell, let's visit the one spot unique to this continent and perhaps the whole world where various rock layers beneath the Earth's surface may be seen in a clear and most spectacular way. Grand Canyon, Arizona. One can't help being impressed by the sheer majesty of the Grand Canyon. Unexplored until the middle of the 1800s, this crack in the Earth's surface is over 200 miles long, about nine miles wide from rim to rim, and roughly a mile deep. At the very bottom of the canyon flows the Colorado River, which eventually finds its way to the Gulf of California. At intervals along the 200-mile length of the Grand Canyon are 19 smaller canyons, generally at right angles to the flow of the river. Flying over the canyon from south rim to north, one can plainly see the Colorado, a lacy ribbon, 
appearing a mere trickle at the bottom of some giant gully. Of special interest are the various layers or strata of rock so evident in the canyon walls. Charles Lyell, as we've already heard, said the most ancient rocks were in the lowest levels, while the most recently formed were at the top. Here we see the black rock strata at the level of the river, in the deepest part of the canyon, almost a mile below the Earth's surface. This rock is the most ancient and shows signs of having been at one time hot and pliable. Notice how the original horizontal layers have been twisted and contorted until some are nearly vertical. Huge and violent forces must have caused these upheavals long before the upper layers were deposited. Before leaving this area, we should note how the fast-flowing Colorado River is full of red mud debris. Thousands of tons of rock debris are carried each day by the Colorado and deposited in the Bay of California. Charles Lyell pointed out that the rocks contained fossils. That is, the bony remains, such as this fossil fish here, and impressions of once living creatures. He further said that the physical evidence of life within the different rock strata provides the key to identifying the relative position of one strata to another. He based this reasoning on his assumption that life began on Earth in a very simple form and over great spans of time more complex forms of life developed. Therefore, fossils would be deposited in ascending order with the most elementary in the lower strata and the most complex in the uppermost strata. To the geologist, a fossil then becomes an index to identify the period in the Earth's history during which any particular strata formed. This principle of Lyell's recognizes that nowhere on the Earth can you find a complete catalog of strata or a geologic column showing every type of fossil. The fossils in themselves cannot tell us the age of any strata either. To Lyell's principles of geology, Charles Darwin added his idea of natural selection, or as it is sometimes said, selection by survival of the fittest. This assumption attempted to explain how one type of living creature, say the fish, evolved into a more complex type, such as the reptile, and eventually evolved into man himself. Although at first Lyell did not believe in the evolution of living things, his principles of geology provided the basis for acceptance of Darwin's theory of evolution. Eventually, however, Lyell did accept the theory of evolution, although he admitted that it cost him severe struggle to renounce his old beliefs. Charles Lyell, a quiet man, with rather poor eyesight, had therefore not only provided the principles upon which modern geology is founded, but had provided the very foundation for Charles Darwin's theory of evolution. Both men hold a great place of honor in British history and are buried in Westminster Abbey. We've examined in other programs in this series how Darwin's theory of evolution has, since its introduction in 1859, formed the basis of our entire philosophy in this 20th century. It has fundamentally influenced every discipline, not only in the biological sciences, but in medicine, literature, education, uh, even politics. And the theory of evolution and today's philosophy rests entirely upon the three assumptions proposed by Hutton, Lyell, and Darwin. If these assumptions are valid, they should be capable of withstanding the utmost scrutiny. If they pass all the tests, we can then be reasonably assured that the theory of evolution lies firmly rooted in the truth. Consider the first assumption by James Hutton that the present is the key to the past. With this in mind, we want to take you now to the Grand Canyon to hear a small part of the geologic history that is given to thousands of tourists each year by the National Park Rangers. Uh, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about the geologic history because scientists speculate that the Earth, or actually scientists have determined that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old. The oldest rocks in Grand Canyon are 2.2 billion years old. So therefore, right here in Grand Canyon, we have a geologic textbook that traces the geologic history of this region for half of the age of the Earth. The park ranger went on to tell us that there were mountain ranges here which had eroded. This most ancient period was followed by inundation of seas, which left the great limestone deposits. 
The inundations occurred not once, but a succession of times. And between each, there were periods when the seas dried up and erosion began again. Finally, he went on to tell us how the canyon was cut by the Colorado River. The real key ingredient, the one that geologists have studied for many years, is actually what caused the downcutting of the Grand Canyon. About 30 million years ago, geologists estimate that there was a slight uplifting of the, the surrounding terrain, the Colorado Plateau that is 130,000 square miles in size in the Four Corners region of Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. And as part of this very gentle uplifting, a ridge called the Kaibab Plateau was uplifted. If we accept this figure of 30 million years as the time when the river began to flow, by a simple calculation, we can see if the present is really the key to the past, as Hutton said. Measurements made of the quantity of mud that the river carries have determined that the rate of erosion of this entire Colorado River basin is about six inches every 1,000 years. This basin, which is upstream from the canyon, is the source of the red mud. If it is true that this rate of erosion has continued for 30 million years, then the basin area should have eroded 15,000 feet below the present ground level. But in fact, the present basin area has eroded only a few feet, and this is why the river flows down into the canyon several thousand feet below. Obviously, something is very wrong, and it cannot be the present rate of erosion since that has been carefully measured. It begins to look as if Hutton's assumption is in doubt. Just to illustrate the lengths to which man's imagination can go, let's hear the ranger once again, this time explaining to visitors how the canyon was cut or widened. It, we haven't cut the Grand Canyon, and we haven't discussed how that exactly happened. Well, there were no great earthquakes in this region. The glaciers that came from the north didn't extend this far south. However, the processes of weathering were still very great, even in, in this dry environment. Rain, freezing and thawing of ice in the wintertime. The wind, which is almost omnipresent here on the rim. The small little animals that do live in the desert area. They burrow into the rock units, and as they burrow, they'll kick out little bits and pieces of the rock. And we remind viewers that the Grand Canyon is 200 miles long, nine miles wide, and a mile deep. And we're asked to believe that it was dug by mice. Without further comment, we shall now pass on to the second assumption developed by Charles Lyell. Lyell says that the fossils in the rock strata are found in an ascending order, and that they are found in that order because over enormous periods of time, life developed in that order. The ascending order, with its associated geological names and ages, is known as the geologic column. Here we see it in simplified form primitive sea life at the bottom, and uh, vertebrates, including man, at the top. The complete column is theoretical, but parts of it are found all over the world. The fossils do actually occur in the order shown, and the geologic column forms a very practical working tool by which geologists make a living every day, including those geologists who are searching for oil. Now, if it is true, that fossils are found in that order because they developed in that order, then we would expect to find a complete series of fossil forms from the bottom to the top showing the gradual transition from one species to the next. Over the millions of years, we're told that it has taken for evolution, the rocks should be packed with creatures having, say, half fins and half legs as fish evolved into reptiles. Uh, we inquired about these transition fossils from Dr. Gary Parker, who has qualifications in both geology and in biology. Well, the modern evolutionists admit the problem. Darwin said there's something wrong. Either my theory is wrong or the fossil facts are wrong. Well, he thought it was the facts that were wrong, that as we studied and dug in the earth and looked for new fossils, we would find those missing links to validate evolution. It just hasn't proved to be the case. 
Even the evolutionists admit that. I might just share with you something from the Field Museum of Natural History Bulletin. David Ralph is curator of that museum that contains 20% of all known fossil species. His article is entitled, Conflicts Between Darwin and Paleontology, Conflicts Between Darwin and the Fossil Evidence. And he says, we're now about 120 years after Darwin. Knowledge of the fossil record has been greatly expanded. We can't blame it on an imperfect record. He says, but the situation for evolution hasn't changed much. By this I mean some of the classic cases of Darwinian change, he says, such as the evolution of the horse in North America, have had to be discarded or modified as a result of more detailed information. He says, ironically, we have even fewer examples of evolutionary transition now than in Darwin's time. Darwin said, the evidence is bad, it's all against my theory. The modern evolution says it's worse than Darwin thought. <laughs> the missing links simply aren't there. The geologic column is a fact, even though very often fossils are found out of place. But the many transitional fossil forms expected, the missing links, have not been found. Rather, each life form appears suddenly and in perfection a fact for which the theory of evolution has never been able to provide an explanation. Another problem with the fossil order, as it is found, is that it does not conform to the theory. Certain fossils expected may be entirely absent, and this is called an unconformity. We want to show you a massive unconformity found in the Grand Canyon. Here, our Crossroads team member has his hand on the intersection of two rock strata in the canyon wall. According to orthodox geology, both the Silurian and the Ordovician periods are absent, and some good explanation has to be found, rather than to conclude that 100 million years of the Earth's history are missing. With these conclusions before us, we have to deduce that Lyell's assumption is false. Life forms did not appear in the Earth's history in the order that they are found. Let us be quite clear what is involved here. Lyell's assumption was taken by Darwin to produce an argument based on circular reasoning. They argued that ascending fossil order is caused by evolution, and then said that evolution is proved by ascending fossil order. Now, let us briefly look at the final assumption upon which the theory of evolution rests. The assumption made by Charles Darwin that natural selection or survival of the fittest was the mechanism responsible for the evolution of one species into another. To be fair to Darwin, we mention here that the science of genetics was unknown to him. At the turn of this century after his death, the idea of survival of the fittest was actually abandoned in favor of genetic mutation. After half a century of research with mutant fruit flies, the experiments have still finished up with fruit flies. Not one has ever changed into another species of fly. Let us return to Dr. Parker once again. Well, even though evolutionists recognize the problem of the fossil evidence, they recognize the problem of mutations, they haven't given up on the theory. In fact, uh, Stephen Gould at Harvard University, professor of biology and geology there, uh, has advocated a new theory of evolution. Here I'm referring to Natural History magazine, June, uh, July 1977. His article has a stunning title, Return of Hopeful Monsters. Return of Hopeful Monsters. Now that's the evolutionist term. And Gould is saying, as a Harvard professor, as a, a man familiar with paleontology, there aren't. Uh, missing links in the fossil evidence. He says most species throughout their geological history uh, don't change at all, or else they fluctuate mildly in morphology, just variation within kind. And so he says the reason is this. The first bird, in a sense, hatched out of a reptile egg, <laughs> much to the surprise and dismay of its parents. <laughs> and so this is the so-called hopeful monster mechanism first advocated by Goldschmidt back in the 20s. It seems fairly obvious that there must be something basically wrong with Darwin's assumption that one species has evolved into another. 
Otherwise, science would not still be desperately searching for a mechanism to explain it. In this program, we have just touched on a few of the areas where the three assumptions upon which the theory of evolution rests are totally unsupported by the facts. We would like to conclude on a positive note and suggest that it was a matter of ecology rather than evolution which gave rise to the ascending fossil order used so effectively as the geologic column by today's geologists. Our theory is based on only one assumption, that the Bible is factual. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and all living things in perfection, sea creatures in the sea, reptiles in the swamps, and other creatures, including man, on higher ground in the forests and savannas. Because of man's wickedness, God sent a flood. The fountains of the deep broke up, tilting rocks up on end and rending violence on a colossal scale. The flood waters rose, bringing with the mud and rapid burial. The small sea creatures were buried first, then the fish, then the slow-moving reptiles, and finally, as animals and man ran for high ground, they were trapped and buried as we find them today. This proposed explanation, based strictly on the Bible record, not only accounts for the geologic column as it is found throughout the earth, but also accounts for those anomalies which the theory of evolution cannot explain. For instance, the sudden appearance in the fossil record of perfected life forms, the mysterious gaps in the record where millions of years appear to be missing, and for those embarrassing fossil finds which sometimes occur out of place in the column. Almost 2,000 years ago, a man called Peter wrote that in the last days there will come scoffers who will laugh at the truth and deny that there had ever been any worldwide catastrophe such as a flood in the past. And they will claim that natural processes were responsible and that these were the same in the past as they are today. Isn't that exactly what Hutton, Lyell, and Darwin have said? We invite you to question these assumptions for yourself because they form the very basis for our lifestyle today. The program you have been watching is also available in audio cassette. This six tape series includes a brief reference guide which summarizes each of the programs and mentions the guests interviewed. This convenient set is available now at your local Christian bookstore or by writing Main Roads Productions, 310 Judson Street, Unit 14, Toronto, Canada, M8Z1V3. Besides discovering that the moon was not made of green cheese, do you know what American astronauts discovered on the moon? What about Mars? Do you think there's life there? Do you think there's any life beyond our Earth? Join us for the next 30 minutes as we explore the fascinating subject of life in outer space. I'm your host, David Maines, and this is Crossroads. In 1957, the world was rocked by the news that Russia had launched Sputnik. From that moment, the United States began an all-out effort to catch up with this new space technology. In 1961, Russia was again ahead with the first man in space. Upon his return, astronaut 
Yuri Gagarin made the statement that he had not seen God out there in space. And as a representative of his government, this would naturally be his declaration of their official position of faith before the world. In our program today, we want to show you how faith in a belief system has also influenced the American space exploration program, and particularly the search for extraterrestrial life. We've pointed out in previous programs in this series that Darwin's theory of evolution is today the underlying belief system or philosophy for virtually every scientific endeavor. Astronomy and space exploration are no exception. Our guests are Dr. Harold Slusher, professor of geophysics and astronomy at the University of Texas, El Paso, and Mr. Paul Olds, director of the Buell Planetarium in Pittsburgh. Dr. Slusher begins by outlining for us the evolutionary philosophy as it relates to the current thinking on the origin of the universe. Uh, the evolutionist view could be summarized very well all by the words of the late Harlow Shapley, who was professor of astronomy at Harvard University. Shapley made this statement some years ago. He said, some people very piously record in the beginning God, but I say in the beginning hydrogen. He said, if we have enough hydrogen, and we have the basic physical laws, such as the law of gravity, the conservation laws dealing with energy and momentum, uh, the various chemical laws. He said, we can explain this universe in all its details. And he said, we can be done once and for all with uh, myths and fables about a god or gods who might have created this system. Now, in his position, you see, uh, you have summarized, really, the evolutionist position. He's saying that the universe is a self-contained system, that uh, you can explain the universe in terms of itself, that there is no need to look outside the universe for anything, that all you need to do is make observations about it, study the laws, and you can deduce its origin. He's saying it's self-contained. He's saying that it started out in a chaotic condition and goes from chaos to cosmos. Uh, he's saying that there is a continual development upward. He's saying further that chance processes give rise to everything that you see that, in other words, as the physicist would put it, the irrational gives rise to the rational, or that an accident produced matter and energy, an accident produced the stars and the galaxies, I should say perhaps a series of accidents, um, a series of accidents produced this planetary system that travels about the sun, an accident produced the earth, produced life on the earth, and that man himself is a production of a series of accidents. This reasoning is based on the assumption that the universe, our solar system, planet Earth, and life itself has evolved. It's the same reasoning which underlines the search for extraterrestrial life, as Paul Oles explains. If you uh, assume an evolutionary origin for life, that life is, in essence, an electrochemical accident, uh, that through random uh, chemical processes, given the proper organic compounds and the proper electrical environment, that you do have the generation of life from inanimate material, then life should be very common in the universe because we know that the sun is simply a normal star, an average star. We know that there are at least 200 billion stars in our own Milky Way galaxy, and the most recent Palomar Sky Survey indicated that there are at least 10 billion known galaxies with similar numbers of stars. And a substantial percentage of the stars that we see in the sky are sun-like. And therefore, one would assume that they do have planetary systems traveling around them and that life would have evolved on those planets, that life is very common in the universe and that a primary goal would be contact with other life forms that may be in a more advanced stage of evolution. The idea that man should have a contact with beings from a more advanced stage of evolved civilization has been a dream of writers and philosophers for more than a hundred years now. Names such as uh, Jules Verne in France and H.G. Wells in England immediately come to mind. It's significant that as the problems in our present world become increasingly more unmanageable, man's desire becomes all the more urgent to meet with some intelligence superior to his own, and hopefully friendly, who would put to right the world's problems. After all, the world's leaders often confess that they're at a loss to know what to do. 
this unspoken wish for contact with a superintelligence expresses itself in the popularity of science fiction books and movies such as Star Wars, just what are the chances of there being intelligent life forms in outer space? We asked Mr. Oles if there is really any proof of there even being other planets like our own beyond the solar system. If we would take a survey of the stars that are relatively near the sun, say within about uh, uh, a thousand light years of the sun, and we would do a survey of those stars, we can, by uh, observing their motion through space, although it is not optically possible to actually observe a planet, as an example, a Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. If we would travel to the very nearest star, the Alpha Centauri system, look back upon our sun, we could not observe Jupiter from the Alpha Centauri system using the very largest telescope that we have today. Uh, so it would be optically impossible to observe planets circling other stars. And it's been proposed that it will probably not be possible even when the Large Space Telescope is put in orbit. Uh, so optical detection is an impossibility even for the nearest stars. Mr. Olds went on to explain the astrometric techniques whereby the motions of stars are observed photographically over long periods of time. Any star seen to describe a weaving or an S-like motion through space is assumed to have a large planet as a companion. Barnard's star is one of these. However, its companion must be massive since planets the size of Earth have insufficient influence on their star and cannot be detected. So we are forced to conclude that there is no evidence of any planet the size of Earth outside of our solar system. Mr. Oles pointed out that radio astronomy is really the only avenue left to us for making contact with the nearest stars. A search for radio signals was begun in 1960 by the National Radio Observatory using this radio telescope at Greenbank, West Virginia. The search for intelligent radio signals from space was continued in 1972, but so far not one signal has been received. Finally, Mr. Olds described for us a more recent attempt to transmit a radio signal from Earth to a point in space which contains a large number of stars in the hope that at least one star may have associated with it a more advanced civilization. In uh, November of 14th, I think, of 1974, the Arecibo Observatory in um, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, which is the largest radio telescope, it's a stationary telescope actually hollowed out in the, a valley between two hills, and uh, it's fixed positionally in the sky, but it's a very large telescope. And using that telescope, they beamed what you could describe as a picturegram uh, toward uh, the stars of Messier 13, a globular star cluster in the constellation Hercules, which is about 24,000 light years away. And um, it was designed, the beam width was designed so that once the signal reaches the stars of Messier 13, it will encompass all of the stars in that cluster. And there are several hundred thousand suns in the Messier 13 cluster. So um, there you have a problem of time, though, because it'll take uh, twice uh, 24,000 years, uh, assuming they reply immediately to our signal for us to get an answer. So assuming someone's around uh, 48,000 years from now, we may know for sure. In the introduction to our program, we said that certain aspects of space exploration were based on faith in a belief system. Now, it has to be acknowledged that Arecibo radio transmission, though small in terms of cost, was a supreme act of faith. Faith in the belief that during the 10 to 20 billion years alleged for the evolution of the universe, intelligent life would also have evolved on other planets. However, they, there are many other examples of this kind of faith in action. And we will recall some other more elaborate ventures and their results next. Until comparatively recently, the planet Mars was, in the minds of most of us, probably the most likely candidate for extraterrestrial life because of its famous canals. 
It will be worthwhile to trace the history of this notion because it's a classic example of how false ideas are planted in the minds of the public. Percival Lowell was a very wealthy American who was captivated by Darwin's theory of evolution. He maintained that the processes of evolution, believed to be operating on Earth, were also operating on other planets. When the Italian astronomer Schiaparelli said that he had seen canali or channels on the Martian surface, Lowell became convinced that life had indeed evolved on Mars. So in 1894, at his own expense, he built an observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, specifically for the study of Mars. He spent the remainder of his life dedicated to this one activity. We want to show you now what Lowell saw through his 24-inch refractor telescope. Just to the right of your screen and past the edge of the moon is the planet Mars at its maximum size as Lowell would have seen it. To see details of the Martian surface requires the extreme limit of resolution of the normal human eye, yet during his 22 years of study, Lowell not only claimed that he had seen Mars, but also had mapped and named over 700 canals on its surface. Photographic techniques were not sufficiently advanced at that time, and most observation was therefore very subjective. Some astronomers saw the canals, as Lowell called them. Others didn't. Lowell published his findings widely and fired the imaginations of many, including H.G. Wells, who wrote the well-known novel, War of the Worlds. This book carried the idea even further for the public. When Lowell died in 1916, he was buried next to his telescope. There is an epitaph in memory of his dedication to the theory of evolution carved upon his tomb. For at least 60 years after Lowell's death, no one could really refute his ideas, which, if true, would greatly support the theory of evolution. During the 1970s, Mars became a great testing ground, and Mr. Oles explained to us what was found. The Martian surface today is devoid of water. The polar ice caps are predominantly dry ice, frozen carbon dioxide. There are traces of water ice there. Uh, there's a very minute amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. The Martian atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide, and uh, water vapor constitutes, well, less than 1%. The Viking Orbiter spacecraft in 1976 photographed uh, a series of arroyos our river ch channels that really appear to be formed by running water. And the longer we've looked at these features, the more it seems to us that they could not have been formed by anything other than water. Large amounts of water that existed and moved at great velocity over the Martian surface at one time. As you can see, these arroyos or dry gullies are not in the least way related to Lowell's canals. Mr. Oles continued to tell us of the life experiments conducted on Mars. We didn't know for sure until Viking landed on Mars, two Viking spacecraft, in 1976, uh, July and September of 76. And uh, one landed just to the north of the equator, the other one landed in the mid-northern latitudes, uh, in the Chrysi Polynesia uh, a plain in the equatorial regions, and the other one landed in an area called Utopia. And, uh, they conducted a series, in addition to photographing the Martian surface, they conducted a series of life experiments, three in fact, three different types of experiments on the Martian soil, expecting actually to find at least simple forms of life, because it was determined that the conditions on Mars were similar to the conditions in Antarctica, the most hostile region of Earth, and life can be found there. Mars, according to the evolutionary theory, orbits the sun within the ecosphere. Temperatures are suitable for water to exist in the liquid state some of the time. Uh, there's certainly enough solar insulation to support life. Uh, so it was expected that life would be found, perhaps even lichen, uh, simple plant forms of life. But Viking found that there was no life. Uh, Mars was sterile. Uh, we did not even find the simplest form of microorganisms, nor did we find uh, the organic materials out of which life is formed. 
Percival Lowell had spent almost a quarter of a century not only acting out in faith what he believed, but also seeing those things that he wanted to see. The Lowell Observatory at Flagstaff is still functional, and some fine work has been carried out there. But since the spacecraft explorations have finally toppled the whole intelligent life on Mars belief, this seems to have left Lowell's public image and, by association, the observatory itself under a sort of odium which our Crossroads television team became aware of when they were refused permission to film on the observatory property. We turn now to another example of faith in action and consider the exploration of the moon. In the late 1950s, Dr. Pedersen of the Swedish Oceanographic Institute had determined the quantity of uh, meteoritic dust which falls on the Earth's surface each year. The well-known science writer Isaac Asimov uh, pointed out that a similar density of meteoritic dust must also fall on the moon. However, since there is no wind or rain on the moon to wash it away, it would have accumulated. Asimov claimed that in five billion years, the dust layer would be 54 feet deep. In anticipation of this, the Apollo 11 lander, which took the first men to the moon, was equipped with large pad-like feet to prevent it from sinking into the dust. Mr. Oles will recall for us just how much was found on the moon's surface. Because prior to the Apollo landings, the, there had been a number of scientists that had predicted that there should be a very thick layer of dust on the moon uh, produced first by the erosion caused by the solar wind, which is a very minimal form of erosion. Nevertheless, it would pulverize a surface layer, produce a surface layer of dust. And secondly, there should have been a deposition of meteoric dust on the moon, uh, assuming that the solar system came into origin five billion years ago, four and a half to five billion years ago. Uh, contemporary theory states that all of the objects in the solar system had a common origin four and a half to five billion years ago. Then, given that time scale, there should have been a significant layer of dust on the surface of the moon in the area of 54 feet. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, there was a very minimal layer of dust, a few millimeters thick, less than half an inch of dust on the surface of the moon. And I think that was very evident in the footprints that the Apollo astronauts left. Almost 600 million people watched on television as astronaut Armstrong took man's first step onto the moon's surface. When asked about the amount of moon dust there was, Armstrong replied, it's only scuff deep. Although few people realized it at the time, the significance of Armstrong's statement is that either the rate of fall of meteoritic dust on Earth was badly miscalculated, or the moon is not five billion years old, but only a few thousand. The conclusion is inescapable, but no suggestion of this appeared in the press. Like Percival Lowell's canals on Mars, the great depth of moon dust just turned out to be a figment of the imagination and once again, the evidence refuted the evolutionary belief system. We return to Dr. Slusher once more for some final comments on further evidence, which indicates that our Earth, the solar system, and the universe is not as old as we've been led to believe. When you look at clusters of stars, uh, you have star systems that cannot have been in existence for more than 10,000 years at the very most. There's a cluster in trapezium, for instance, in which if you projected the motions of this group of stars back, the individual stars, back to a common point in space, it had to have originated only 10,000 years ago at the most. When you come down to the solar system, you look at the breakup of uh, comets, you get an upper limit on the age of the solar system of 10,000 years. They should have disappeared from the sky. When you look at the small amount of helium in the Earth's atmosphere, when you look at the uh, non-equilibrium state of carbon-14 in the atmosphere, when you look at the decay of the Earth's magnetic field, you get an upper limit of only uh, uh, 10,000 years at the very maximum. Uh, when you consider the cooling of the Earth, see so the Earth is cooling down from its primordial heat, uh, the heat that it would possess at its beginning. But if you started the Earth out at a temperature roughly what it has today as a habitable planet, which one would assume, you know, uh, the Lord would have created it as such, 
then it would take only several thousand years to cool down to its present state. I think when you look at various physical indicators, you get an age that is only on the order of several thousand years, not millions of years or billions of years. And I say this on the basis of strict uh, physical indicators that have very few assumptions involved in them. There are other examples in the space program of faith in the evolutionary belief system. One such example is the $8 million lunar receiving laboratory built specifically to test the moon rock samples for signs of life. They were found to be absolutely sterile. The search for extraterrestrial life began with high hopes. One wonders if those hopes did not have attached to them an unspoken wish to find some life, any life, which would provide an explanation for life on Earth. After all, many scientists are coming to realize that there is no such thing as a simple living cell and that these highly ordered units cannot come together by chance. It is at this point that the need to find an extraterrestrial life source becomes mandatory. Over the years, the popular press have brought before us in beautiful pictures and in technical detail the space experiments, hopes and expectations. However, when the results are negative, this does not make exciting news and we tend to hear little about it. Often the official conclusion is, we are continuing to evaluate results. When we consider all those negative results, we are left with an age for our solar system and Earth of thousands of years rather than billions. The significance of this shorter age is that if this is true, then life cannot have appeared by the evolutionary process. And to state this conclusion publicly is in the truest sense of the word heresy, because it calls into question the evolutionary belief system. We want to leave you with a message of hope. May we suggest that the alternative belief system given in the Bible better fits the facts. In this book, which has served man for several thousand years now, the Creator God tells us that in six days He created heaven and earth and every living thing. You have been watching Unit 2 of the Crossroads Creation Series entitled Scientific Evidences. The next program in this series is Unit 3, Social Darwinism. This 100-minute video cassette explores the topics of nature or nurture, Darwin's legacy, Darwin without excuse, and humanism and evolution. They're available now at your local Christian bookstore or by writing to Main Roads Productions, 310 Judson Street, Unit 14, Toronto, Canada, M8Z1V3.